नमो तस् भगवतो अर्हतो संबुस् नमो तस् भगवत अर्हत संबुस् गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन who are joining from north america others who are joining from other places it may not be the morning for you so thank you very much vivek and the team for inviting me for this dhamma talk i have been listening to the stories and um, i'm glad that kids are sharing dhamma in this group and making it open available for others to learn so today i'm going to discuss about a little bit about um, something that may be really important in formative years for children um this is also connected to something i had already discussed in a previous event when i joined this team um i think for reminders i would say um you may remember the story about hijacking if not i i will present it again today as uh, hijacking um is a story that i like to share because it happens to all of us in our formative years in teenage years and i will begin it with uh, the story of how this young girl um from a school in north america she has been thriving in mathematics she has been doing perfectly well in school and at home she had her mom waking her up at 5 in the morning for music lessons and she was doing fine when she came to the age of 14 um you know toward the end of her age 13 14 she started getting annoyed she was uh, hissing at his her mom and and his uh, her dad and also at school she continued to have better grades but she was starting to feel like she was um she was able to do things that she she knows things and she has friends so some something was going on inside of her which parents were aware of and it sounded like she was wanting to do heroic things and just before her maths test she was given something by two of her friends at the school this is just before she she sat for her mathematics exam so they they had 30 minutes into the exam and her friends suggested that okay shall we do something before the test this will help us focus this will this will help us score better so our subject um she decided to go with the two friends they went to the bathroom and they gave her something they gave her some some kind of a medicinal thing as they said and they said you know try this this will help you do well in mathematics exam and these two girls um, also tried it but in a mild dose dosage and the other girl having had it she said well i don't feel anything and they gave her more and she said i don't feel anything so she, then she was told by two of her friends that okay you will feel it later so then they all went it was a time for the test they sat in the examination hall um in a, in in a matter of 20 minutes this girl started throwing up and screaming and she felt hallucinate hallucinating and then she started yelling at the maths teacher this maths teacher has been her favorite teacher but she started screaming and yelling and the maths teacher freaked out and 
ran to the office, ran to the school principal and said, this is what is happening in my exam hall. Can you come and investigate? So the matter was taken to the principal and this girl pointed at the two friends who gave, gave her something. And the two friends, you know what they did? They betrayed this girl saying that it was her who gave something to these two girls. But then the principal, you know, stopped the exam and investigated the whole situation and asked, you know, what is happening in this class? Now you all have turned to age 14 and you all have been doing great things and what is stopping you from doing great things? And then the story is, you know, they separated all class students and separated everyone's stories and got the story that it was these two girls who has been bringing uh, poisonous stuff, substances to the school. And toward the end, they found out the true people who brought it to the school and suspended them because this girl also was um, about to be suspended from school had she not told the truth. So her truth was understood and she was allowed to come to the school. But again, she went going to the school and she was doing fine. And then she got the attention of a boyfriend. And that boyfriend gave her a cell phone and she started texting um, day and night, texting and sending pictures day and night. And these pictures could include anything. So her parents were alarmed and said, you know, you are using this phone too much. You know, you go to bed with it, you wake up with it and you are texting too much. You know, you are messaging this and that. Why don't you really, um, you know, cut down your time uh, using this cell phone. And this girl was getting, you know, angrier toward her parents. Um, and so parents saw that this girl was obsessively using the phone and her grades could be affected, not yet, but could be affected. So at this point, her father grabbed the phone when she was in an angry situation. Of course, this may have gone a little bit um, uh, tensed in the house. And she ran away from home. Straight, she went to the police and she reported that her father abused her. And police um, doesn't know whether the story is true or not. They had to listen to her and they have to wait, investigate. Her father was um, also arrested. And uh, then there's, you know, the, the court, there was a court case against the parents filed by this girl with the support of police. And then when it usually goes to a police uh, situation, uh, they assess how much wealth parents have and the course, court case runs uh, as long as uh, the money of parents run out. And the girl was sent to foster care because uh, of her complaint. But then at foster care, they gave her, they, they, she demanded the cell phone. So they gave her it and they were really like investigating what she was doing with the cell phone. And she happened to send a uh, send the same kind of messages that parents were complaining about. And then, you know, she even later revealed the truth that she was lying about the whole parent situation. And now she is missing, missing home, missing parents, the place where she has been growing, place, you know, where she had uh, doors open to come and that she had food available and she had her friends and relatives coming and going, you know, that kind of a place. She felt like she was missing it. And in this story, I love sharing this story because, you know, hijacking happens to all of us at certain age. In this girl's story, 
she was hijacked. Her intelligence was hijacked by hormones and her intelligence was hijacked by drugs. Her intelligence was hijacked by the use of electronics. Her intelligence was hijacked by her conceit, mana. Conceit, you know, really came to her and she's a novel, she's the hero, she knows um, much better than teachers and parents and she wanted to be highlighted. So when story, uh, when stories like this emerge, you know, they come to us. They bring these children to, you know, since the beginning, they have been bringing these children to the temple. So we know it from the first hand experience that we need to have a different approach for these kind of children. So when your intelligence is hijacked this way, you have lost the ability to say no to something that is harmful to you. you. You have the ability to say no to something that is harmful to you when it is given to you. You have the ability, you lost the ability to uh, refuse things that take your peace of mind, the peace of mind of your parents. You had, you lost the ability to say no to those things. So I share this story also because I want you to understand that this does not only happen to girls, this happens to boys, this happens to teenagers, this happened to many, many, many of them. And I love to share pr present day stories to teach Buddhism so children understand the gravity of what is really you know, happening around them. And parents sometimes trust their children too much and leave the cell phones and electronics and anything you know if in in human life if you use anything more than four hours a day this is an addiction if you use your cell phone more than four hours your day you have an addiction toward it and you can notice it when it is when it has affected your sleep patterns that you forget to sleep by three in the morning even knowing that you have a test uh, by eight in the morning the following day. You have a, a, a Spanish test at eight in the morning and you haven't slept until three because you have been busy watching TikTok videos, Facebook videos, Indian idols and videos from American or other places and you have been laughing and secretly having a different world created, different bubble to be in. When this has happened to you, I'm sure you have an addiction, an obsession that you need to work on. So this is very, very important for teenagers in their formative years to have strict discipline because the Buddha says discipline is key for the sasana to last. When monks have good discipline, people also follow the same because people join the order. Join the order means they become monks and they follow the same kind of discipline. And therefore, Buddhism lasts forever, the Buddha said. For your lasting forever, Vinaya, your discipline is key. And you know where it begins? It begins from where you live. This is a, Pal, a Sinhalese poem that I like to share. It says, Because you don't understand any of it, I will translate it into English. According to the place where you sleep, you can know the animal. When you go to a cage, you know which kind of animal lives there. Even if you happen to be in a forest and you look around by smelling the place, by observing the dirt around the cave, 
you can notice this is a, a nest of, a, of bears. This is a nest of a lion. You know, based on the place where you sleep, you can tell what kind of animal is living there. Based on where I sleep and where I live, everybody can know where, you know, what kind of a person I am. This is the meaning of the poem. Based on where the animal sleeps, you can make a guess of what kind of animal is living there. And based on where you live, people can know who you are. So it begins with from your, your place of residence, where you stay, not just your room, the whole house. If you have developed a habit of, you know, throwing the dishes into the sink, leaving it for your parents and going back to your selfish <laughs> world again, without respectfully cleaning the dishes away and placing them in the right order, you have not learned to show respect toward your parents or the food that you have received for free. In my home, when I ate, I had to normally make sure that my place of eating was super clean, that I had not dropped any single grain of rice on the floor or on the table, that I have eaten exactly the amount I served on my plate and I have washed my dishes and made sure my mom was taken care of, that my mom wasn't too stressed or my dad wasn't too stressed, that when I had harmonious attitude toward them, they knew that I was a peaceful child and I was a thoughtful child. And it is a gift that I could give them since the early days. It is a gift that made them live healthy, that made them rejoice in my progress, not just the academic progress, but also my progress as a thoughtful and careful, considerate child. So I said about the place where you sleep, if you have kept it in a nice way, if you have maintained it, uh, if you have, you know, organizing a room is easy, but maintaining is the hardest thing. Maintaining requires discipline. You take something, you take your books and you have a place for them to, um, you have a place for them to like, to, you know, you have a, you know, when somebody suddenly enters your room, you know your, where your books should be. And they also learn it from you. They respect you as a person who maintains everything neatly. And, or, you know, if your room is messy, you have a cluttered mind. Because you may have been hijacked. Your intelligence may have been hijacked by something. Suddenly, sometimes, you know, somebody that is not so interesting you interesting to you in your neighborhood, maybe a little boy, a little girl, maybe an interesting person because of the hormone changes that are happening. This is when um, this is when you your I see these chat messages coming. I guess I will invite you all to stop chatting until the Dhamma talk is over because I get distracted trying to read these. <laughs> I think that the chat messages are about uh, the Dhamma talk, something like for me to speak louder. So I try to pay attention to them. Um, if you are chatting and listening, I think you are, you are, your, inter your, your attention is divided. You may miss some part of the Dhamma sermon. <laughs> so I have this very kind reminder that, you know, uh, this should not be practiced during a Dhamma sermon is in progress. Uh, because if you come to the temple, uh, you won't be using any uh, electronic media when monks are giving Dhamma talks because 100% mindfulness is important. And that is how you give an example to children. So I was talking about neighborhood girls or boys. You know, sometimes you say, you say them as normal people. And for teenage people, all of a sudden, they appear to be uh, beautiful. And this is when you bring them home. You lose the ability 
to control yourself and you bring them home because you have infatuations about these people. You feel affectionate towards someone. It all begins in the thought. When this was happening to Buddha's attendant, Ananda, um, he, he went to the Buddha and said, I'm feeling interested about women that I saw. And then the Buddha said, Ananda, don't look at them. Right? Don't look at them. And don't um, talk to them. Don't associate too much of these women. And if they happen to come and talk to you, you stay as alert as possible. You stay as awake as possible to not, not let defilements control your mind. Therefore, for children, I strongly recommend that in your formative teenage years before marriage, you, need, you don't need to let defiled mind control you and hijack your intelligence. If you keep undefiled mind, um, if you maintain an undefiled mind, you will be able to ace in your exams, you will be able to choose the right partner in life, you will be able to choose right spiritual companions in your life, you will be able to have, um, you know, some habits stopped. For example, procrastination stopped. You stop procrastinating because you do what you have to do today itself. That has been my motivational uh, phrase that do it today. That ha I have been that way all the time that do it today is my motto. I remember it all the time. I keep doing it all the time. And when I have not, not been overloaded, I don't overlap and I have been able to manage my day properly and go to bed at the proper time and be free from um, drowsy and uh, sleepy uh, start of the next day because I can start fresh the following day. Sometimes we also get hijacked by food intoxic intoxications. You uncontrollably go and eat. One time um, this mother and the child came to Mahatma Gandhi. They walked a couple of miles uh, to meet Mahatma Gandhi for advice. And this mom said, my, my son has a habit of eating sugar. You know, please give him some advice to stop eating sugar. And Mahatma Gandhi said, you know, come in two weeks. And she, she was puzzled. Why is he asking us to come in two weeks? And she went anyway. And in two weeks time, she came with her child and asked the same question. At that point, Mahatma Gandhi told the child, um, don't eat sugar. That's all he said. And this mother was like, why didn't you tell this to the kid last time when, when we came. And Gandhi said, it's because I also had to learn how to stop sugar. I had it as, as a bad habit. Now I have been able to stop it myself and I can set an example to this child so that he will stop sugar when I look at his eyes and speak it with my, with my vibe, with my, my truth because truth has power. So this mom understood the message and the kid definitely stopped eating sugar. So I, I trust that you parents and your, you know, whoever you live with, first, you know, the example begins at home. If you have overloaded your refrigerator with sweet stuff, there is a tendency that children will go and pull things and eat. In my home, we didn't have things like that. We didn't have a refrigerator. We didn't even have electricity growing up. I can share my whole life story at a different talk because time is uh, coming to an end. Um, but again, it begins at home. 
staying neat, keeping a peaceful state of mind, maintaining your discipline, not letting uh, addictions uh, come control your life. So you will have a peaceful mind. Do you have any questions before I, before I wrap up? Bhante, uh, it's not a comment or a question. I must uh, submit to you the, the, the timing of your discourse. I think every teenager is hearing this. Probably there could be no other wisdom and uh, uh, considering the various uh, television stories and uh, mishaps and uh, the life of children getting lost because of this abuse of uh, space technology. I'm a space scientist. We have given the best technology there, but it is being highly abused. It is abused. Today, I am a part of the WHO infodemic management. Infodemic is more harmful than pandemic. Mm. So, Bante, you have thrown a light and I wish this is recorded and each teenager who is holding a mobile in the hand, they understand, especially in India, because of the lockdown, even the smallest children are using their mobile. A two-year, one-year-old child is given a mobile. Mother is safely avoiding the child at a party. I wish your discourse, however small and few, it is very off. It's not a question. It's only a compliment and many, many thanks. It is the right way of telling Namo Buddha. Thank you. Namo Buddha. Thank you so much. I didn't, I didn't know your background and it's very timely that you shared it. Infodemic is a... <laughs> It's stronger than the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> One day you can see an Amitabh Bachchan coming with small children. And in India, civic sense, I'm worried. If a child is used as Shivakaji to produce crackers, if a child is used in Kashmir for woolen shawl, we get annoyed. The smallest children are brought there for selling some consumer goods. Is it not abuse of child uh, human rights? It is. I think it's the time that we should say no. That's why I'm saying uh, my mobile is my weapon because COVID has given me mood and mood. <laughs> I stop abuse of technology. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Jasprit, do we have a time for a question? Um, yeah, we are at time, Parvinia. Yes, why not? <laughs> okay, so just a quick question. So, Bantiji, thank you so much once again for the discourse. I think uh, it was very useful, especially for the kids. So, one thing, Bantiji, when you said uh, that anything that you are doing more than four hours, you know, can be considered addiction. My son was very prompt to just tell me that he is attending school more than four hours online. <laughs> Okay, so is that addiction? <laughs> so I know that where he's coming from, but could you please help them understand that, you know, you know spending time on good things? Yeah. Well, considering what he does, it's, you know, if you break school into several subjects, you know, it's different small subjects that he doesn't do science for four hours. <laughs> he doesn't do maths for four hours. So it's, a, it's all like information coming in different uh, times and lengths. So it's not actually four hours of doing school in that sense, you know, of course you do it, you sit in front of a computer these days and learn. And that is um, like you said, you do it for your own improvement. But, you know, your son and other children also need to understand that there are harmful things that you do more than four hours. And that becomes an obsession, an addiction, and it has this evil energy 
this is where you need to be careful of it of it it has this evil energy to control your life and take it in a direction that is not intended by you in your formative years without you knowing you have become someone like a robot and i know a true example of this you know one family doctor's family raised um, two, three doctors children and parents were also doctors but then this son went to dental school and started abuse using cocaine and he for seven years he is a school dropout and he doesn't do anything he cannot focus and i say to the parents that you did your part you sent him to dental school but it was this child who was hijacked you know by cocaine you know parents were not told the truth parents really cannot know what is happening in the school when the child has lost his wisdom you can be so smart to get into a dental school but if you just didn't learn to say no socially maybe he was too underage when he went that far to a dental school that he he just wanted to again his conceit he wanted to be a hero which is why he did what he did and in the end it has consumed his life and now he does gambling he is stealing money from all his other doctor family members and he is just getting into a car and driving all around united states not knowing not having any direction in his life i feel so sad seeing him but when your brain has wired together based on what he what it has fired you know what brain that neurons that fire together wire together when it has happened to a child like that it has irreversible damage so take school as a positive thing that you are doing it is shaping your future not the electronics not the computer addiction not game addiction uh, nothing like that will will come to you to for your improvement so be very very careful make space for good things in the mind because mind is where you live not your home <laughs> you don't live your in your home you live in your mind which is an unlimited area make sure you you know you have school stuff coming not other stuff <laughs> i hope that helps <laughs> Bhante ji, did you have final uh, words, or that was beautiful final words? But if you have something else, uh, just wanted to request. Uh, no, this to... is good. I mean, the time went really quickly, um, but we can meet again with other <laughs> other stories. Yes, yes. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much. This was really beautiful. Yeah, I feel like there were so many things that we learned um, in, during your talk about distractions, about role modeling, about calming the mind. I think this was perfect for everyone. all the audience members children you know teenagers us adults everybody so thank you so much um and for uh, moving to our next speaker i um i feel like i have a really um you know great privilege to uh, host her today i have been able to meet with her before during our ambedkar lecture series um she's amazing you'll i'm sure you'll all really enjoy uh, meeting bhasha singh um so bhasha singh is a journalist and a writer she's associated with news click and she's written uh, extensively on the issues of marginalized uh, marginalized folks especially dalit women minorities um and farmers she's the author of the book unseen i have that book and you should get it it's really good um and it's been translated into many languages uh, she's received many prestigious awards as ramnath goenka award for excellence in journalism and many fellowships her book talks about her book is here it talks about manual scavenging a casteist practice that's still prevalent in india as a lot of us know um against the people born in safai karamchari community for the past 15 years she has been associated with safai karamchari andolan an organization under the leadership of bejwara wilson whom we were also privileged to host um and uh, 
and who's working for elimination of the practice of manual scavenging and rehabilitation of Sapai Karamcharis. She has been covering, doing ground reporting and um, and the most recent, of course, Indian farmers protest extensively against the farmers bill. So I'm sure that we'll have a very enriching conversation today. And the topic that uh, Bhasha Singh is going for is courage, women from press classes and Dr. B.R. Ambedkar. So without further ado, I would like to invite her. So happy to have you here again. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> thanks a lot, uh, Jaipreen, to uh, everyone. And uh, it's really a pleasure to uh, listen and to be part of this platform, uh, which I have met in a very different